it's wonderful to have you here for session two of our Ichthus Bible School. And uh, we're really looking forward to a great treat um, this morning from Colin Green. I'll allow him to introduce himself in just a moment. But first of all, I'm going to pray for him. And uh, let's pray together as we prepare our hearts for this session. So, Lord Jesus, Lord, we just welcome you here. We welcome your presence among us again, Lord. And I pray now that you would fill Colin with the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, and all that he's studied and all that he's prepared and all that he's considered to share with us this morning. We pray that it will come through with real life and clarity and uh, on the flow of your Holy Spirit, Lord. Help us to take into our hearts the things you want us to receive this morning, Lord, and we pray that our hearts will be good ground for the seed of your word and your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Colin. Morning, welcome. I usually bring feedback, but not with such clarity. So, in a perpetual feedback loop. So, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for having me. This is the best workplace you could ever be in, and I feel so joyous to be here. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, I'm originally from the People's Republic of Liverpool, uh, but now a citizen of the Kingdom of Heaven. Amen. One is better than the other, you decide. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, nowadays uh, I'm a student of early Christian history at university, uh, as well as working a little bit. Um, but my connection with Ichthus goes back more than 10 years, and I was very blessed 10 years ago to do the one-year training course called RADNET, uh, the Radical Network, and uh, that stayed with me for the last 10 years. So anything today that's a blessing, thank them, and anything that's not a blessing, I'll hold up my hands. I did a, a wonderful study project that they all prayed for me, and that ended up being a book, um, which I'll take off camera now, because otherwise you'll think it's just a sales pitch. Um, and. Um, Today, I've been given the, top, blah, 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 the topic of exploring the Bible for the historical Jesus. Uh, and the question I'm asking by that is, did Jesus live on earth? Now, you might think, why on earth are we asking something when you all know the answer? But there is a reason. But the question will be simply the question of, did Jesus exist? Did he walk through Galilee and Jerusalem at all? Um, I'm not asking the kind of historical question as in what kind of man he was, but really, was he there? Um, I'm not really so much asking about was he the son of God on earth. I'm not really asking a theological question today, just a historical one. Was he there, a Jewish man in Jerusalem and Galilee? Of course, the answer is yes, but I wanted to show you, if somebody said, how would you explain that? I thought, well, well, how would you? And hopefully today you might get some ideas and either enjoy or be blessed or maybe even take something yourself and, and use it in your own way. But why? Um, it's not a question anyone used to think about, surely. Well, a few years ago, um, a guy called Lawrence Singlehurst, who many of you may know, he was at YWAM, he did a bit of a survey of people's engagement with the church. One of the questions he asked was, do you think Jesus was a real person? expecting a good response, and the response of yes was only 60%. So who are the other 40%? Who are they? Well, it gives you a reason to start talking about it. We can't just leave 40% of people nowadays thinking, mm -hmm, Jesus. So I looked into it, and really they fall into three groups. There's people who are a little bit skeptical about things they don't know about, but they're very glad when they're shown, to go, oh, OK, I didn't know. That's great. Then there's another group of people um, who I've engaged with more, who, people who really don't want Jesus to exist. They don't want Jesus to ever exist for reasons that are somewhere down in their own hearts. And I'm not going to judge that. Um, but they've really pressed me, and I'm really grateful to those people because they've made me work harder and say, well, if the answers I'm giving you aren't good enough, what am I missing? And asking the Lord, Lord, what am I not seeing? And trying to give them better answers. And there's a third group, and that's people who, if you said, was Napoleon a real person? They'd go, hmm. And if you gave them a choice, Napoleon, Churchill, Sherlock, which is the odd one out, you may not get the right answer. 
So there's really those three groups in the 40%, but hopefully what I'll do will help. I think with a lot of the hardy people who are atheists, I've tried to help and it's been in vain, which is quite humbling, but maybe a blessing to some of, some of the others. Um, so I usually do this for atheists, and for them I focus more on evidence outside the Bible. Um, but this is the Bible school, so I want to give you something that you kind of know yourself, uh, but that you can do something with, because you're Rickless people or friends of, and, and you know your Bibles. So nothing that should surprise you, but hopefully you'll think, oh, I sort of knew that, but this is a fresh way. So as you go, I just want you to go with the evidence. Um, in my course, um, I'm a sort of postgraduate research student, and you just train, go with the evidence. It's a secular way of working, that's what I have to do there, and using secular approach. So where's the evidence? So hopefully that will help. So um, if we could have um, the slide uh, with uh, a string of people, six degrees of separation. You may have heard of this. Um, this is the idea, it's a newish idea, it's a great idea that everyone in the world are only about six degrees of separation from each other. So you could be six degrees of separation from the most famous person you've ever heard of. The most famous actor, your favourite actor. Sounds silly, but it's not really. So for example, do you know your local vicar? Or your church leader? Your church leader may know the local vicar. If you do, your vicar knows the bishop. The bishop knows the archbishop of Cat. Archbishop of Canterbury and Canterbury he knows the Pope and the Pope knows all the world leaders so if you know your local vicar you're within less than six degrees of separation of every world leader actually and it's the same now you're kind of doing that today with everyone um, who's people who are alive at the same time but you can also do it going back so um, if we can have the next slide and I'll show you now these are on your sheets if you've downloaded the sheets from the website they are there um, but um, I want to see, if you look at the ancient church, how far are people, what are their degrees of separation? So you can see here um, two people, and that's because I want to think of someone who's just one step away from Jesus. John's Gospel is written by someone called the Beloved Disciple, and people take that to be John. I'm not an expert on that, but Debbie is, uh, I'm sure did a talk for the Bible school, so if you want to understand who is the beloved disciple? Go back to that. Uh, I'm not such an expert on that one. But there's someone who says, I'm the beloved disciple. I knew Jesus. I've written this gospel. It's just one step away, one degree of separation. But some that um, were probably less argument about, let's go for a picture with three people. This is two degrees of separation from Jesus. And... Um, I think I've got Luke there. Is it Luke? Great. So Luke knew Jesus' brother James. How do we know this? Well, in Galatians 1.19, sorry, Acts 21.18, according to my notes, Luke wrote this in the book of Acts. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James. This is James, the leader of the Jerusalem church. So if Luke went to see James... And James was James's brother. Luke is two degrees of separation from Jesus. Luke wrote Luke's gospel. Read Luke's gospel and you've got it. Something written by someone who's just two degrees of separation from Jesus. We could do the same with Paul. That would be three people as well. Because Paul knew James and Peter and John. They knew Jesus. Um, if we could go for the next slide. I'll just I'll whiz through some of these. Um, because there's more on your sheet if you want to look at more. So three steps away we could have... Irenaeus. Irenaeus lived in the second century, but he knew Bishop Polycarp, great name. Bishop Polycarp knew the apostles, and the apostles knew Jesus. So again, just three degrees. So we've got lots of stuff in the early church of people who are not far from Jesus. Here's a quote from Irenaeus. Um, Polycarp also was not only instructed by apostles and conversed with many who had seen Christ, but was also by apostles in Asia, appointed bishop of the church in Smyrna, whom I also saw in my early youth. So Irenaeus saw Polycarp, who knew the apostles, who knew Jesus. And there's more, more on the sheet. Um, there's another slide there with even more people on who are just not socially distancing at all, um, but they survived to tell the tale. And um, 
I've got an example, uh, I think Papius there, I won't read the whole thing, but Papius in the second century knew Philip's daughters. Who's Philip? Book of Acts. Philip knew the apostles, the apostles knew Jesus, and so it goes on. Now the reason I'm pointing this out is there are so many lines from all over the place pointing back to Jesus that it can't all mean nothing. When you've got so many lines all pointing back to Jesus, there has to be something at the start of that, and the simplest explanation is Jesus. It's very strange to have all these people who've got a chain that goes all the way back to Jesus, and then not to be anyone there. I'm going to have the uh, next slide. So where does that take us? So Paul, we said, was two steps away from the historical Jesus. Paul knew James, Peter, and John. So what can we do with Paul? Paul wrote letters that are in the New Testament. And um, usually when I do this, uh, again, I'm doing it primarily for people who are, are not believers or in the 40%. So I try to be fair as possible and meet them on their ground. So I don't say, well, this is the word of God. Of course, we can, we can see it with the eyes of faith. But for people who have not got faith, I try to uh, make it easier for them. So I just rely on uh, just a few letters by Paul and ones that all the secular scholars are agreed that Paul wrote. Mainly just Romans, which Roger's been teaching on. One and two Corinthians, Galatians, one Thessalonians. That's all I need to use from Paul to get there. Um, now you might think, but they're in the Bible. If I'm a skeptic, are they going to accept that? Um, should that make us more skeptical as a Christian? No. But for other people, well, I say, let's approach this like an investigator, a secular investigator would, and say, well, where do these letters come from? Well, secular scholars say they came from Paul, in his own words, eyewitness writing about what he knew in the 50s of the first century. That's only 20 years after Jesus. So very close. You can't dismiss those because somebody put them in a collection. The Bible's a collection of books. So I try to say to people who are a bit disengaged, well, look at it that way. Look at them. Paul's letters as something you can just take on their own, on their own merit, and see what they say. So, but why Paul? Well, Paul was a contemporary of Jesus. Some people will say, no one contemporary of Jesus wrote about him. Oh, yes, they did. Paul was uh, like Jesus in the first half of the first century. He knew the same places in Jerusalem. And um, he initially wasn't a believer. As you'll know, he persecuted the church. So he started from an independent position. That's helpful if you're talking to someone who says, should I use the Bible? Oh, well, yes, he is an independent voice. Uh, Paul's letters, autobiographical, firsthand. This is fantastic, helpful stuff to have. Um, and um, he says he knew the churches in Judea that believed before him. Those churches believed before him in the 30s, in the first century, in the time just after Jesus was ministering in Galilee, in Jerusalem. Put all that together, and Paul takes us right back to the start of Christianity. So why am I saying that? Because if we want to discover if Jesus existed, we want to know who's talking about him and why is, why is he a credible witness? So if we look at what Paul tells us about how did he get there, how did he get to be a witness, um, let's, let's look at the story he tells about the 30s of the first century. How did he get there? Where does he fit in? What happened according to Paul? So from Paul's letters... Those few letters are mentioned. You get a mention of Jesus' ministry, that Jesus was betrayed and crucified. You get that from 1 Corinthians. That followers of Jesus carried on following Jesus after his death, but now as churches, that's in Galatians 1. Other people were apostles before Paul was, and he names, for example, Peter and James, Galatians 1. Other people were in Christ, as Paul puts it. Other people were in Christ before he was, and he names Andronicus and Junia. That's in Romans 16. Paul persecuted that church. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, Galatians 1. Paul uh, was converted to follow Jesus. Then Paul stopped persecuting the church. That's in Galatians 1. Paul went to Arabia. Paul went to Damascus. Paul avoids arrest in Damascus. And we now know where we are historically because Paul 
puts a date on it, he says, avoids arrest in Damascus while King Goritas IV was around. Who? Well, you don't need to know too much, but you do need to know that he, when we know when he died, 40 to 41 AD. Now, I know that's 2,000 years ago, but 40, 41 AD, it's only about 10 years after Jesus was ministering. So we know that all those things I just said happened in the 30s of the century, first century. We've got an eyewitness, Paul, that takes us that close to the historical Jesus. So what he's saying really matters. And in 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Romans, 2 Corinthians, and 1 Thessalonians, uh, we get little snippets of um, the story that people think is only in the Gospels. People think, oh, but there was no story of Jesus until the Gospels came along. Well, there was. Paul wrote in the 50s. Secular scholars will tell you he wrote in the 50s. And in his letters, we have this. And you'll know this one. Roger mentioned this this morning. Jesus was an Israelite. How do we know that? Because in Romans 9, 5, it says to them, the circumcision, the Jews, belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Messiah, the Christ. So he's from the Israelite race. It says in Romans 1, from the family of King David. Well, this is a historical person by the sound of it, but is the more. Yes, Jesus arrived into the world out of a woman. We all know what that means because we were all there once. And um, summing up, there you got Jesus is of the Jewish race. He's born out of a woman, making them a Jewish mother and son. What about Jesus' family and upbringing? Well, as well as a Jewish racial background, he had a Jewish religious background. We know that because in Galatians 4, it says he was born under the law, which means the Jewish law. So Jesus had a pretty normal Jewish upbringing. In his own family, Jesus had a brother named James, Galatians 1. And he had other brothers who had wives, 1 Corinthians 9, verse 5. So these brothers were part and parcel of his Jewish childhood and upbringing. This is not from the Gospels, this is just from Paul writing in the, the 50s of the first century. This is early stuff. What about Jesus' ministry and death? Does Paul say anything? Yes. Jesus had a ministry specifically to Jews. As Roger said this morning, talking about Romans, it says Christ became a servant of the circumcision, or a servant of the Jews, Romans 15. So there's Jesus' ministry. What about the last week of his life? Well, we know where it was, according to Paul. He says he was in the land of the Judeans, the home light of, of the Jews. This is where he died. That's in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 15. What about the Last Supper? Yes, according to Paul, Jesus was handed over or betrayed at night time on the night of a gathering which extended from before supper till after supper at which Jesus handled some of the food and a cup. That's in 1 Corinthians 11. This is a historical person, by all accounts. This is all in Paul. Jesus' death was linked to Passover time, a very specific time in the Jewish calendar. Not just in the Gospels, it's in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7. Some people of Judea caused Jesus' Jesus' death. Paul writes, the Judeans who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets also drove us out. So, we know where Jesus died, and we know who was behind it. Am I getting this from the Gospels? No, I'm getting it from Paul, writing really early, really close to the historical Jesus. You don't get all this and not have a historical Jesus behind it. How did Jesus die? Well, by crucifixion. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8, by crucifixion, the Greek word is starosam. Um, and therefore, if it was crucifixion, only one group of people killed people by crucifixion in executions, the Romans. So it was the Romans who were there executing Jesus. Jesus' body was buried, and of course that goes on to talk about the resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 4. So there is your earliest account, if you like, of Jesus' life. People will say the Gospels were written later. Okay? We've all agreed that we can use Paul's letters, hopefully. Some nice early ones, ones that all the secular scholars accept that Paul wrote, and there you go. So you don't have to look just to the Gospels for Jesus' life to find a historical, G historical Jesus.
the earliest record of Jesus' life is from the 50s in Paul, 20 years or so. I've repeated that, but just to get to the end of that point. So that's good. And there's more in Paul. What was Jesus like? What was his character? Well, Paul says Jesus chose a life of poverty. He describes Jesus as meek and gentle. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, and chapter 10, verse 1. What about Jesus? Who did he go around with? According to Paul, the 12. That's in 1 Corinthians 15, 5. Paul just assumes that the reader knows what he means by the 12, because obviously it's the 12 disciples. So again, there's the life of Jesus, so much of it, his ministry. What about his teaching? Do you need the Gospels? Well, yes, but you can go back to Paul, because if you compare Paul's letters with the Gospels, what about the apocalyptic teachings of Jesus? Well, if you look at 1 Thessalonians chapters 4 and 5 and compare it with Matthew 24, 25, you'll see it looks very similar. What about Jesus' moral teachings? If you look at Romans chapters 13 and 14 and compare that with Mark chapters 7, 9 and 12, you'll go, oh, that's very familiar. These are not just odd little sayings. They're big chunks of teaching in Jesus' words, in Paul's words. So, clearly Paul knew about the historical Jesus. We've got to the end of that bit. And breathe. We've uh, an idea who Paul learned it from, Peter, James, John. He learned it from the people he'd persecuted because he'd been questioning them. And he probably learned it from the Pharisees who probably put him up to the job of um, persecuting them. So, where does that get us? Well, we should go on to the Gospels. So let's go on to the next slide. We move on from Paul to the Gospels, because naturally we're talking about the historical Jesus. Do the Gospels really help us to find that Jesus existed? Well, I'm going to focus on two. Can't do everything. And I'm going to focus on Mark and Luke. Uh, Mark's a great one, because most scholars will say uh, he's the earliest. You can make another argument, and Kristen has been at the Bible school making other arguments, which he's brilliant at, but I'll go with what most people will agree, because that's fair for talking to sceptics. Now, Mark and Luke, as we saw earlier, are just two steps from the historical Jesus. So Mark um, knew Peter. Peter knew Jesus. Two steps, not far away. Um, if you try to be sceptical, there are things that you end up avoiding if you're a sceptic. Things like Jesus going around with fishermen debating about fish in Galilee. It's so ordinary, it's not great stuff for making up. It's not like a myth about a God coming to earth. You can talk about those things, but a fisherman having a conversation with Jesus about fish, it's so ordinary. But if you were really sceptical, you would say, oh, but we can write up the Gospels as myths about God's coming to earth and God's coming to earth. That never happened. But at some point, they've got to confront the ordinary stuff in the Gospels. And this is where you find that the Gospel, like Mark, is a million miles away from myth. C.S. Lewis made that point uh, when he was in one of his books, I think, Mere Christianity. Is Christianity like a myth? Well, it was his job to know myths. And he read myths and he said, these Gospels are not like myths. So let's look at some of the reasons. Let's suppose you were in the ancient world and you wrote fiction and you wrote myths about Greek gods or Roman gods, Apollo, or Zeus, or, or whatever you want. You can start with a blank piece of paper and make up whatever you want. It's your own choice. You're the fiction writer. Whatever suits you, it's up to you. You don't have to include anything you don't want to. So let's start with Mark, Mark's Gospel. Does Mark make the sort of choices you might expect a fiction writer to make. In the ancient world, let's put that to the test. Is this gospel a myth? Well, first, if Mark was a fiction writer who wanted to write a story of a god on earth or spectacular, why would Mark choose what we really find in his gospel, setting it so close to his own time and to a place that was so close at home? First century, recent memory, Galilee, it's too close. Myths about gods, they're usually in a land far, far away, long, long ago. Mount Olympus, gods in Greek places. Very romantic and exciting. Galilee, recent memory, 
That's not how you write myths. What about the death of Jesus? In ancient myths, gods would have spectacular deaths, exciting deaths, fantastical deaths, slain in a heroic battle, or poisoned by a crazy lover, or um, magically done to death by a mythical god. Jesus, nailed to a cross. This is not how you write myths. Jesus, a victim of a political conspiracy, the sort of conspiracy that happened in Jesus' day. This is not how you write myths. That's a myth. This is Mark's gospel. You can see the difference. What about um, when Mark tells the story of Jesus being raised from the dead? Now, you might say, oh, but that's, that's supernatural. Yeah, but what about a little thing you may not notice? Mark doesn't describe Jesus emerging from the tomb. Well, you remember these guys who can write myths, they can make up what they want. So wouldn't they have a fantastic description of Jesus coming out of the tomb? Flashing lights and special effects. Mark doesn't even show the picture. He just has a little mention that Jesus is alive again and gone to Galilee. That is not how you write myths. A mythical writer would write a mythical scene. So, now, what about one more way of uh, seeing it's not like a myth? Only about a third of Mark's gospel contains anything supernatural. The other two thirds don't. That's not like a myth. Myth just go from one exciting scene to another. Not having someone standing around teaching and getting into conversations. And here's, here's a big one. If you're writing a myth, you have, and it's a god on earth, you have big descriptions, his suit of armor, he's fast, he's strong, he's tall, he's got an amazing hairdo, whatever. Descriptions of Jesus in the Gospels? None at all. If you're writing a myth, you have a description. The Gospel hasn't got a description. The Gospel is not a myth. And why would, like we said, why would Mark choose dull, rural Galilee as a location for a myth? Why not set it on a Greek island, top of a mountain, in the clouds, getting together with other gods? No, nothing like that. Nothing so exciting. Mark just tells it like it is because he's not writing a myth. I know what ancient myths are like, and there's other people in this room do as well. They're not like this. Um, I've studied them, so when I was young, one example of a book of myths, The Aeneid by Virgil, written 2,000 years ago. Now, I used to be able to translate the whole of Book 4 of the Aeneid from Latin to English, but I was young. Now, these books are full of magic and myths, going to the, all kinds of strange places and meeting strange monsters, full of strange monsters, not Mark's Gospel. So, there you go. Mark's Gospel has Jesus going around the lake with fishermen, talking about fish and doing things that ordinary people do. Very human form of death. Not an entertaining spectacle, his death, caused by political shenanigans. Doesn't get a hero's description. You got all that? We've summed that up. So if two-thirds of Mark is not supernatural, what is it? And who is it for? Because it's not myth. Are we closer to getting to a historical Jesus? Well, now, now we can go in a bit closer. That was a bit of a wide shot, like in a movie. What if we go in a bit closer? What does Mark's gospel do? And there's many answers to that. But I want to suggest one of the answers is that there were many accusations flying around about Jesus in his own day, but people still throw in these accusations against Jesus, even 20, 30 years later. And Mark's gospel, apart from his teaching and apart from the last week of his life, this two-thirds, that is not supernatural, includes a lot of allegations against Jesus and his answers. It's kind of like we would talk about nowadays an apologetic to give an explanation for why we believe in the faith. Well, for people in the early church, in Mark's gospel, we've got answers to all the accusations that were thrown against Jesus. They didn't go away, so it was necessary to circulate a gospel to see Jesus' defense of himself. And it reads as a defense of Jesus in his own words, as told by Peter to Mark because he's two steps of separation.
Why? To set the record straight about Jesus, because people were always trying to discredit him. For example, much of Mark's gospel is aimed at showing that Jesus was not a violent anti-Rome revolutionary. There's too much to cover on that point, so some smaller ones you'll know from Mark's gospel. He was called a blasphemer. You know the story, who can forgive sins but God alone? So Jesus' response, heal a man and forgive his sins. The story of the paralyzed man. Another one, because I've got ten here, I'll whiz through them, ten. Um, a drunkard who eats with sinners. That was an accusation against Jesus. You're a drunkard who eats with sinners. And we get Jesus' answer. That's in Mark chapter 2. And the place of that, Levi's house, you know the story. Another story, Jesus is, has this one thrown at him. Why aren't your disciples doing what John's disciples do? Fasting. And we get Jesus' answer. That's in Mark 2. Jesus faced with another one. Why are you or your disciples doing what's unlawful on the Sabbath? And you get Jesus' answer. This is the story of the cornfields. People come and they say, he's out of his mind, this Jesus. And you get Jesus' answer. That's in Mark 3. Then they say, he's possessed by Beelzebub. He has a demon. And you get Jesus' answer, Mark 3. You get this stuff about being a prophet without honour. And you get how Jesus deals with that situation. They ask, why, why, Jesus, why do you let your disciples eat with unclean hands? And you get Jesus' answer in Mark 7. I hope you're going to look these up later. Um, he's asked, why haven't you given a sign, Jesus? That's what they ask. And you get Jesus' answer, Mark 8. And then they try and catch him out with the law. They're thinking, ah, Jesus can't handle the Jewish law. And you get Jesus' answers, for example, in Mark 10. You wouldn't make up all these accusations against Jesus if there wasn't a historical Jesus. If you're writing a myth, you can make up what you want. Why would you make up a world in which everyone's throwing accusations against Jesus? Why do you have Jesus' answers? Because answers were needed because people were making accusations against a historical Jesus. So there's one way you could look at it with uh, the sort of skills we learn in secular scholarship and say, okay, there was a historical Jesus. You just don't make up accusations for their own sake. Not if you're on the same side as Jesus. It's the opponents who make up the accusations. Well, that was Mark's gospel. What about Luke's gospel? Now, remember, we're still two steps away from Jesus because Luke says uh, he was in Jerusalem and he went with Paul, and he says, the rest of us, we went to see James. So Luke got his stories from a good place. Luke knew James, James knew Jesus. We're very close to the historical Jesus. And one thing we'll notice is that Luke accepts Mark's gospel as historical, which is a sure sign that Luke believes in a historical Jesus. So here's one way to assess it. Did someone really live there? Start with someone who's investigated it before. And Luke says he has. Luke is the first person in history to say directly that he had investigated these things. So I'm going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Uh, you don't need to turn to it now. Uh, I'll just read it to you. Luke says this. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the first, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account. That is Luke saying what he's doing. So I'll just recap quickly. He says, many have undertaken to write in a gospel. Well, who? Well, Mark, for example, because Luke knew Mark's gospel. We know that. And these were handed down, down from eyewitnesses and other people. And then Luke says he's got all this stuff. People have given him Mark's gospel. He's carefully investigated everything. And he's putting it together into one bigger, longer gospel because he wants it to be an orderly account. Uh, he likes to put it that way. 
So Luke accepts Mark's gospel as historical. And we know what he's doing. This is helpful because sometimes skeptics will say we know nothing about any of how any of the gospels came to be written. This obviously isn't true because Luke, firsthand as an author, tells us how he did it. His gospel actually tells us up front he's not claiming to be an eyewitness, but he says exactly how it came to be written. So as a historian, student historian myself, I can say that this is a really, really good way to start. This is what a historian needs, a document that is upfront about how it was put together. It makes everything just that bit more credible. So Luke tells us the following things. Uh, written accounts, written about Jesus, gospels in his possession, his own version, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Now, but is Luke right? Yes, modern scholarship has borne out that what is said here by Luke is true. Because at least three different sources have been detected in Luke's gospel, like, like he indicates. One, the gospel of Mark, like I said. That's all merged into Luke's gospel, which means Luke has investigated it and accepted it as a historical evidence. Then there are some sayings in Matthew and Luke's gospel that they call Q, which just means source. Some parables that are only found in Luke. So the stuff from Mark, stuff from these, this Q source, and stuff from uh, some parables, three sources, which means all these three sources all point back to a historical Jesus. That source points to Jesus. That source points to Jesus. That source points to Jesus. There are things coming to this historical Jesus from all angles. You don't get that without something being at the start of it. And the simplest explanation is Jesus. So there's a lot of credibility having these different sources and investigating it. He's like, Luke is like a news reporter on the six o'clock news facing the camera and telling us what he's learned from the eyewitnesses he's met, what he's learned from his investigations as a news reporter, what he's learned from the documents he's seen. That is exactly what Luke is saying. That's what he's doing. So what is clear is Luke believes that Jesus of Nazareth was a historical person. If he did so, having done all that background work, then if you want to be a skeptic, and you may want to explore those things, I'm not going to criticize you for that, but you need a very good reason if you're going to deny that Luke was right about Jesus existing. Luke says Jesus existed. You need a really good reason why Luke would be wrong. You have to have a really good reason why all these things would be wrong. How are we doing for time, Debbie? All right. Oh, super. Oh, I wanted to get this bin. <laughs> but some people will say, oh, but the Gospels, Chinese whispers, telephone game. You may know what they mean by that. Some people are suspicious because they'll say, yeah, okay, there may have been a Jesus of some kind, but people tell a story, then they tell it to someone else and they change it, tell it to someone else and they change it. By the time it's written in the Gospel, this may not have anything to do with the historical Jesus. That's what some people would say. They call it the telephone game. But what if that's not quite right? So that's the suspicion. But it presupposes a certain kind of culture. Um, so, I'll just leave it still on the gospel slide. Um, but not the right kind of culture. To be that kind of culture with everyone whispering to everyone else, you've got to be the sort of culture where people just sit around the campfire at night telling each other stories. But it's not that kind of culture. This is a synagogue culture where people read the law and the prophets, not just telling stories off their own ideas. If you read the law and the prophets on a weekly basis, you are a partly written culture from the start synagogues were the centers of Christianity and then assemblies that were similar. So there's no reason, no reason to think that these would mysteriously change for no reason from being a partly reading and writing culture to suddenly being a, one where people just make up stories and change them every five minutes. This isn't a Chinese whispers culture. What about something Jesus said in Matthew 13, 52? He says, therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple 
of the kingdom of heaven is like a head of a household who brings out of his treasures things new and old. Every scribe who has become a disciple. It sort of jumps out of you. It doesn't mean all disciples were scribes, but it does mean some of them were. Scribes, literate followers of Jesus, who knew how to make notes at the very least, so they would have kept notes. We knew that people who followed rabbis, they kept notes. They had little notebooks. They really did. We know that. So that was a practice. So this undermines the notion that there was nothing but Chinese whispers going on. It's not that kind of culture. We've got scribes. What else? Even if it was an oral culture, people are very rude about oral cultures, but they shouldn't be. Because we know from oral cultures, such as the Vikings, long time ago, but the Vikings didn't have reading and writing really in any substantial way, but they preserved everything they knew from incredibly detailed, accurate memory. From business contracts, treaties, their family trees, their genealogies, epic poetry, that would be books and books of poetry, all memorized by specialist trained people in their community who learned from a very young age how to retain sophisticated information. So even if it was an oral culture, in those days you had specially trained people who didn't change it every five minutes. But we can do even better than that. Because really the relationship of Jesus to his disciples and then the disciples to the church wasn't storytelling in itself. It was teacher and pupil. And this is crucial. If we don't understand that, we, we can sort of miss everything. The disciples were to receive Jesus' teaching, not invent their own. And then when you get the book of Acts, where it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the point is the people listening to the apostles were meant to receive the apostles' teaching, not invent their own. So this is a teacher-pupil relationship. This is not a Chinese whispers relationship. They're not sharing stories around the campfire, they're receiving it. It's quite a sort of conservative, conservative culture, small c, conservative culture. Teacher pupil learning, memorizing, repeating, that's how you learn. So there would have been many people in the earliest Christianity who could read and write. Uh, Acts chapter 2 tells of significant numbers of believers. It would be really strange to assume that all of a large number of people would have no one who was literate. Really strange idea. A few chapters later in Acts, we're told that priests had joined the movement. Priests could read and write, at least to some degree. It's not all Chinese whispers. There were Christian assemblies beyond Jerusalem, and Peter couldn't be there, every single one, all the time. So they needed written material. So the Gospels fit the bill, as do Paul's letters. It's not just a storytelling culture. Um, and letters were sent out, as we see in Paul's letters, as we see in Acts 15, in lots of examples, and we see that other places in the ancient world. There was a culture of sending messages in letters. If a message was important enough, you could write it down, send a letter. It's not a Chinese whispers culture. So, in light of all of the above, it's obvious how silly it is to compare this to the telephone game, Chinese whispers, and this is the difference. The telephone game is designed to be played by children, not adults. The telephone game does not have the motivation of teacher and pupil. The telephone game is only allowed in whispers, not normal volumes of speaking like a teacher gives. The telephone game only allows one person to hear at a time and pass the message on to one other person at a time, rather than a whole group learning together in the early church and in the disciples, that's a whole group learning together. That is not the telephone game. And the telephone game allows a person to hear a message only once. They will say this only once. And with no opportunity to ask for the message to be repeated. Whereas teacher pupil, you ask the teacher, could you repeat that message, Paul? Could you repeat that message, Peter? And you memorize it. This is not the telephone game. So the gospels, you can't write them off because it's not that kind of world. The comparison with the game actually illustrates how different the reality was, and that is helpful. Learning in the early church had adult pupils, learning as a group, listening to teachers, speaking in normal volumes of voice, learning through repetition and memorising it.
So I think we've set out the question that needed answering. If you were looking at this in a kind of academic way, the question you would ask is, the evidence about Jesus, is it better explained by Jesus existing or by Jesus not existing? And all of this evidence you can see is easily explained by Jesus existing. It is not explained at all by Jesus not existing. The trail left by Jesus, the circumstantial evidence, it's as good as proof. And one more thing that I didn't mention at the start that pretty much caps it off. If you were ever thought about it, if you are thinking about a historical figure and they're supposed to have existed, almost all of the time they did. Very, very rarely or never do you hear of a historical person who didn't exist. So for example, you might have a favorite sports team if I look up a book about my favorite football team and look through a list of players going back 100 years, there were no players in that list who didn't exist. If you do your family history and you have all these cousins and uncles and aunties, you'll do that and there won't be anyone in your family tree who didn't exist. So as a rule, the normal thing is if somebody is a historical figure and they're supposed to have existed, they did. The exceptions are rare. So when you approach Jesus, you have to approach it the way you normally do. You can't make an exception and say, oh, he's a special case. If someone's supposed to have existed and you've got all this evidence, then only a certain sort of fringe scepticism could possibly doubt it. If you're in a university setting where they teach about these things, it's not even a question. No one doubts it. So... Um, Maybe just go to the next slide. I wanted to suggest some books that you might possibly be interested in. Um, there's a couple of books there by Paul Barnett. He's a bishop, uh, I think, or a clergyman living in Australia. He's written some super books. Um, I've mentioned just a couple there. He writes in a, quite an accessible way. Another super book, uh, Lydia McGrew, Undesigned Consequences in the Gospels. And she can look at the Gospels and Paul's letters and see things that are coincidences that no one just made happen. Something in Paul's letter here makes sense of something in the Gospel here that wouldn't make sense quite so much without it. It all ties together. That's helpful. And um, there's lots of examples. I really recommend her book. It's quite an easy read. Um, if you really wanted to look at the hard stuff about people who really deny uh, Jesus existed, and for whatever reason that's in their hearts, uh, Greg Boyd and his friend Paul Eddy have written a book called The Jesus Legend. But it's, it's quite a heavy read, but if you feel up for that, that will cover all, uh, all the angles. Um, because almost everything I have said, if somebody really, really doesn't want to believe that Jesus existed. If someone doesn't want to believe that, they'll find a way and they'll challenge every single thing. Um, that book covers all of that. I've also put uh, the internet for my blog there, um, again, which tries to cover off all the little things people could say about just about everything I've said. But um, I think that's probably enough. Um, and maybe I should just hand over back to, to Debbie to pray and to uh, give you any important messages.